please be seated. Well, if you have uh, noticed, uh, the sort of songs that have been uh, sung this morning is really based on hope. All right, there's a word hope that has been sort of running through as a theme to those uh, songs. And that's because today I want to preach about uh, faith and hope. Uh, last week, we kicked off the series on the power of faith, and uh, Pastor Bruce uh, took us through the, the theme of walking by faith, uh, not by sight. And uh, one of the key verses that uh, we have been using is, uh, if you look at the slide, Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things uh, the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. So when you talk about hope, it's linked to faith. Uh, if you think, if you look at it carefully, uh, hope is a product of faith. Hope is built on the foundation of faith. And that is what Christian hope is all about. And today I want to look at what is that relationship uh, between faith and hope and why hope is so important. You see, the, the general understanding or usage of hope uh, in our lingo today is more of an expression of a, a feeling of expectation. Uh, well, the sun has come out, I hope, today uh, it will remain just as sunny. So it's just a feeling of expectation. Or I, I hope uh, I will get this uh, job. So it's a desire uh, for something to happen. So that's, uh, that's how we use hope. And in fact, we Christians, we also tend to use this type of hope. And we can wrap it up in the form of prayer. I mean, for example, people may say after the New Year and the Christmas, I hope I can lose uh, 5 kg. Uh, and Christians, we can pray and say, Lord, help me to remove 5 kg. Right? Or... Uh, people will say, well, I hope that having failed two times in my driving test, third time lucky, uh, I hope to pass. And then we Christians, sometimes we just wrap it up with, Lord, I failed two times. Uh, can you make me pass a third time? Isn't it? So what's the difference? Well, we just wrap it up with, I hope. But that's not really the biblical hope that what Paul is, uh, sorry, what the, the Bible here is saying because the biblical hope is something that is very certain. In fact, hope is uh, the expectation. I put that hope is the expectation with a rock solid certainty. I call this a biblical hope. All right, to distinguish from just a general use of hope is a biblical hope, which is it is an expectation. It is something that will happen in the future. Yes, hope is about future. Hope is expectation with a rock-solid certainty of a future fulfillment. It will happen based on why? why, on what basis? Based on the faith in what God has promised or for who is. And such hope can never be disappointed. Right? The biblical hope means that there will be a certain 100% fulfillment. But where does hope come from? So hope, biblical hope comes from faith. This is the uh, foundation of hope is faith. And of course, we, you think about what is faith then? All right, last week, remember? Uh, faith is basically to trust in what God has said and who God is. That's how we have faith. Faith is basically just trusting God. And God will prove himself to us in his faithfulness over time. And we start, we start off our faith journey by having received the saving faith. We get saved to become a Christian, right? That's how we start our Christian journey. And faith itself is a gift of God, isn't it? Because the Bible t tells us that we were spiritually blind. We have no knowledge of God. In fact, we were rebels against God. It is God in His mercy that He opens our eyes. He's the one who gives us the ability to be able to believe, but we have to receive that gift 
that gift of faith, you have to receive and say, yes, Lord, thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for opening my eyes. I gladly receive that salvation. I gladly acknowledge what Jesus has done for me. He died for my sins, and he's going to change me. And that is the beginning of our faith journey. And that is the first planting of hope, the hope of our salvation. But our journey of faith does not just stop there, because our saving faith means that we're going to grow, grow our faith in our living faith. We're going to live as a Christian, having been born again, we need to grow. And so, as we trust God more, as we read more of His Word, as we understand God's ways, uh, as we experience Him, that's what um, Claire has shared in our daily, weekly journey with God, uh, our, our, our hope, there will be different hopes based on the promises of God. Well, just now Claire was saying that, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. So we have different types of promises based on what God has said, and it's all in the Word of God. So the more we have our journey with God, the more we trust God, uh, and out of those uh, faith, we have hope. So what I'm trying to say is that whenever we have faith and belief in God, there must be hope. And as Christians, very often we say, yes, I believe God, but then where is your hope? We somehow just say, yeah, hope is just something, just like the general use of hope, it's a bit wishy-washy, okay, it's a wishful thinking, yeah, it may, it may not. But we tend to forget or underemphasize the importance of hope, which I hoped in this sermon, I hope, certain hope, a biblical hope that this sermon will help us to grasp the importance of biblical hope in our daily living. So we start off by saying that for our hope came, uh, comes from faith. And faith rests on the Word of God. Right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing from the Word of God. This is what the Bible says. So for example, we have definitely heard of like uh, what Jesus said, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the word of God. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So if you receive that as a, you say, yes, Lord, I believe, I receive that rest as you promise, and most promises have conditions. So in this verse, for example, you have to come to me. That's what Jesus said. Come to me. You have to come to me. You, this is the condition for you to receive that promise. If you don't come to me, even though you are weary and heavy laden, you will not get your rest. But if you obey that promise, which is the condition, and most promises have condition, then you will, you will receive rest. This is his promise. So you have a biblical hope that you will receive rest either straight away or soon, because you say, Lord, I'm so weary, heavy laden, I need rest. And God says, I will give you rest if you come to me. So do you see that all the promises of God, most of them have conditions. So some, of the, uh, some may not have, like, pray for the laborers in the harvest fields. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. There's no condition. There's, well, even then, you need to pray to the Lord of the harvest that you get, you hope to get laborers, right, in, in, in the harvest field. So do you see that there are many promises that are conditional, but there is a solid hope. It will happen. So don't just pray without hope. Then maybe that is not pray in faith. That's not asking in faith. And faith itself also uh, will, will help us in our attitude. Is it not that you believe God's word? Your state of mind can be changed because of what God has told you, your experience, your journey with God. And also, God's word also dictates what sort of actions you should take in your daily living. So, you know, in the 70s, we have this phrase that, oh, because at that time was charismatic, everybody was just worshipping God and spent the whole afternoon praying and blessing the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with that. And then there was this phrase to say, oh, don't be so heavenly-minded that you're of no earthly use because you spend your time just 
Oh, the Lord, the Lord. You know, then what about your work? It's not important. Just worship the Lord. So it's like, what about service uh, com- to the community as Christian? Oh, it's the Lord, and so on. So, so there was this imbalance, all right? But I think these days, with our me culture, what's in it for me is about me. It's all the consumerism, the latest gadget, materialism. I don't think we have got too much of a heavenly mindedness. If anything, the earth has gone, the world has gone into even the Christian mind. So I think that is another swing of the pendulum. So it is important for us to have the Word of God constantly uh, moving in our spirit so that our mind is filled with the Word of God and the promises of God. Do you know that there are, somebody say, or counted 5,467 promises in the Bible. 5,467 uh, 5, promises in the Bible. If you divide it across a year, 365, if you read the Bible throughout the year, you, you have on average 15 promises of God a day, if you care to maybe think about it, extract it. And so we need to to be able to understand and then to lay hold and apply the the promises of God because that's when you live your life as a Christian. You need to walk by faith, not by sight, and faith comes on the Word of God. So you need the promises of God. You need to stand on the Word of God and build our hope on that faith. Okay, and hope, as we show later, is very important. So what is this biblical hope then. You see, this biblical hope can transcend reason even. So in Romans 4 verse 18, talking about Abram who was 100 years when God years old and Sarah I believe was 90 years old and God told uh, told Abram that you have a son uh, next year. When he was 99, next year 100, he will get a son. He could not he could not, he find it wow, this is would you be impossible to, to do it? It's like, wow, God, is this like, it's not the Bible, are you joking? But it's really, he believed God. And the, in Romans 4, 18, it reads, in hope, Abram believed against hope. What does that mean? In hope, he believed against hope. So he has, so basically what it means is that he who has no reason for hope, because he's too old, his wife is too old, so even though he has no reason for hope, in faith he went on hoping. So this is a biblical hope. Or Phillips, uh, one of the commentators, will say that when hope was dead within him, when faith was uh, sorry, when hope was dead within him, because there's no hope, it's too old, right? Biologically, there's no hope. So when hope was dead, dead within him, he went on hoping in faith. So this is what biblical faith is. Because he is fully convinced God can do it because God has told him so. So even when faith, so faith standing on God's word uh, means that it will go even against reason in things that they look incredible. Your reason will say it's incredible. But when the reason says cannot, your faith says you can because God says so. Right? So standing on the word of God, on his word, uh, what he has done, who he is, is the way in which we have our faith and that's how our hope uh, is, is, is built on. So why is hope so important? Why am I belaboring the point of hope? Oh yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, there's hope, but okay, yes, there is that certainty. Yes, but what? So what, basically? All right, it will come to pass. So, okay, I will thank God. So, let's think about why hope is so important. So, let's look at the next uh, scripture. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for helmet, the hope of salvation. So, can you see that? What is a fa- uh, what, what does a, the breastplate uh, protect us from? It's a heart, isn't it? Okay? 
And here Paul is saying the breastplate of faith and love, and love dwells in the heart. Love does not just dwell in your mind. I cannot just love you by thinking of you solely. My, this, my heart is the seat of who I am. If I say I love you, I just cannot just love you with my mind. It also has to involve my heart. But from this verse, hope comes in the mind. Right? Helmet, the hope of salvation. So faith is of the heart and hope is of the mind. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay. Hope is formed in your mind. Faith is in your heart, right? You believe. But then out of faith, remember hope? The, the, the substance of things, faith is the substance of things hoped for. So when you believe something in your heart, believe on God's word, hope should be in your mind. It should be birthed in your mind. And if you think about it, in Ephesians we have, you know, the, uh, Paul talks about the whole armor of God and all together there are seven uh, pieces if you include prayer. But yet Paul just did not really emphasize those other pieces of armor when he wrote to Thessalonians, uh, to Thessalonians. But he focused on the breastplate of faith, which is to do with the heart. Yeah, sure. If, somebody, if, if something goes through and pierces your heart, you're dead, right? That's, it's quite important. Uh, uh, Whereas the um, uh, other pieces of armor may not be as, as that important, all very important. And then the helmet, uh, the hope of salvation. So, Paul singles out those two pieces when he talks about faith and uh, hope. And we all know how important the mind is. Do we not know that um, our mind is a battlefield? Even right now, there is a battle going on in our mind. In Romans 12, verse 2, if you go to the slide, it shows you that uh, Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So if your mind is not renewed, you'll be still thinking of the patterns of the world. So when we become a Christian, it's not a clean slate, our mind. Our mind is influenced, or it's been, in a way, patterned after what we have been, perhaps, affected by our culture, uh, it may be effect, definitely affected by how your parents convey to you values, uh, how, the, how you see in the media, how you mix with your friends. Uh, you, you'll be saying, oh, this is the way the, the world works. This is how I should also flow along. This is what the, the world values. Uh, so I'm persuaded or pressurized uh, to follow that as well. Uh, we may have our own prejudices. And of course, if you are brought up in a Christian home, hopefully your mind has, you know, the, the Word of God, the patterns of the ways of God, but, but there is a spiritual, there will always be a spiritual battle going on in our mind. But if you are brought up in a non-Christian uh, family or your, your Christian parents did not really do their job that properly, then our minds are programmed or have been conditioned or indoctrinated or taught, whatever you call it, or trained to think in the ways of the world, not in the ways of God. Because when you became a Christian, you don't automatically have the Word of God already inside your head, right? Nothing, right? Only say, oh yeah, maybe for God so loved the world. I, knew, I know a few verses, uh, and it's not really, it may be in your mind, you may have it in your memory, but it's not the one that shaped or trained how you think. So our brains are still conditioned, have been have the patterns of the world uh, imprinted, steep in it. Or we may even have a wrong views of ourselves, which we don't even know. We may have wrong views of other people. That's how important is our mind. That's why Paul talks about the need for us to renew our mind. And then further on, uh, in Ephesians 4, he, 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 he wrote these uh, words, right, that... Um, Next, yeah, that as the truth is in Jesus, as you become a Christian, you need to put off your old self. And this command is for everyone, whether you're brought up in the Christian home or not. There is an old self. There is that lingering self that is in rebellion to God, that, that is the way of thinking is opposite to the way of God. It's, it's hostile to God, which belongs to your former way of life. It's corrupt through deceitful desires. You may say, I don't even... 
I think it's fine. Oh yeah, because you're deceived. The only way that you, you can undeceive yourself is to have truth. And here Jesus is the truth, right? The way, the truth, and the life. Truth can only be found in Jesus. So we need to deal with our deceitful desires, right? Like money, right? We all love money. We de desire money, or most people. Because I know, because you see a 10 pounds note on your way to church, will you just, I didn't, that's yeah, fine, you know. You know? Okay, maybe you're honest, you put it to charity, all right? But I don't think you just walk past a 10 pound note, you probably say, oh, praise the Lord. God has blessed me. Nothing wrong with uh, God blessing you in this way. I don't have a problem with this. But the, the Bible says that uh, be careful, right? We have all types of patterns in our world, all types of deceitful desires. And in 1 Timothy 6, 9, in particular, it says those who desire to be rich, because the world is, everyone wants to be rich. And it's not unusual for Christians, including myself, to have a desire to be rich, right? How many of you say you don't want to be rich? Come on, let's be honest. Right? Maybe you're so rich that you don't want to be rich anymore. <laughs> but it's a warning, 1 Timothy 6 verse 9. This is a deceitful desire, you know that. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many, many senseless and uh, harmful desires that uh, will plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all evil. So how do we deal with that? So we mentioned that in our workplace, our desire is not so much as to be part of the rat race, but it's really to say, Lord, your word is for me to serve you, not as to serve man, but ultimately, even though my boss is good or bad, doesn't matter, I'm still serving God. I will use the best of my abilities, my gifts, to serve the Lord, and if I get promotion and I feel that this is the right way, this allows me to have a greater influence, it's where God has placed me, it's fine. You get your promotion, you get your pay. That's the consequence. You can become rich, not a problem, if God has guided you that way, or you may not be that rich, or you may still be below average income. Doesn't matter, because in the end, the, the Word of God tells us to learn to be content. But doesn't mean that we have no ambitious, uh, no ambition for God, okay? So you, have, you see what I'm saying? A desire centered on God is to the best that I can be to serve God, use my gifts to serve society uh, and, and, and do whatever God has told you to do. And in the process, yes, you may get money and so on, but that's the way you then become a, a better steward, of God, a good steward of God's money. So that is our, the right desire. It's always to make Jesus as Lord, but don't get sidetracked and have a deceitful desire by the world. And so this is what I'm trying to say is that we need to renew our mind. You need to get rid of deceitful desires, to align it properly, right? To align it properly so that we know how to live our lives rightly in the sight of God, right? Not hiding away in some monastery, in some cave, don't want to deal with the world. No, God says you are in the sort of the world. You go right in, right? Be in whatever organization God has placed you. Be the best employee as the Lord enables you to be. So these are, as an example of our mind, the need to be renewed. And so, I was so glad that um, Claire shared that, you know, she, she may be praying, she may be asking God, God, I want a job, I need, I need a, a training, right? That's quite real. But then God didn't answer her prayer. I'm sure Claire for 100 jobs, you must have prayed 100 times. Lord, this one, this one, this one. Oh no, oh no, no, no response whatsoever. Very discouraging. And then what about all my friends have got their placements for their internship? What about me? Lord, have you forgotten? Nothing. So what I'm trying to say is that sometimes God allows us to go through trials, sometimes not even answering what you want, but God is actually teaching us uh, how to mold our character, how to learn to deal with our disappointments, how to learn to trust God more. Learn how to wait because God doesn't come too early or too late. He just come on time, right? On the day that that's it. You should have got your placements. You got the three emails. So this is the way God sometimes works. Now, how does then hope uh, deals with the mind? We talk about the helmet of um, the helmet of hope. 
Well, let's start with a hope for eternal life. How about that? In Titus 3, verse 7, he says, So that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The promise of God is that whoso, for God so loved the world, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. That is the promise of God. So we have that faith. We have that substance of things hoped for, the substance of eternal life, because we believe in Jesus. And it all comes about, why? Because of God's character, is it not? For God so loved the world. Because God is love, based on the love of God, based on what God has done, He sent His Son. But we need to do our part, and that is to believe, right? Whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So this is the promise of God. This is the substance, which is eternal life. But what about the hope? How does that hope then affect our thinking because of eternal life? This is what I'm trying to say. There is something that is a helmet of hope based on your belief that God has given you eternal life. Something must change in our mental thinking. It should not just be, thank you, Lord, I have eternal life, and let me just get on my own. No, we need to start to train our thinking based on the hope. We need to retrain the patterns of our thinking based on the hope of that promise. So, okay, so for example, yesterday we have a memorial service uh, for one of our long-standing members. Some of you may know, uh, Connie Tochart. Uh, She worked as a health care visitor for most of her life, and then she joined a mission organization uh, serving in Hong Kong. She lives in uh, five years there. And then she was smuggling Bibles. She has this courage to smuggle Bibles into communist China. Not afraid to to be caught. She must have that confidence, that faith in God. Why? Why has she got this attitude, this posture? I believe that because she has this hope of eternal life. That the lives of the the Chinese people, uh, through reading the Bible, is, is, is really worth so much that... It doesn't matter even if she's caught. She just has to believe that God will see her through. So this hope of that eternal life drives her to share the gospel even at risk of being arrested. Of course, she has faith for that. Connie also has this hope of um, desire of seeing her parents have obviously moved on. Uh, So she always has this joy, this expectation uh, that will be very infectious to the people who say, look, I'm going to see uh, my parents one day, I'll be reunited uh, with them. And so, so it, it sort of shapes her thinking, shapes her outlook of life. That uh, this is, there's something to look forward to, and this also causes her to be joyous, and so on. And it is also hope that gives her, and to some of us who may have just recently lost a loved one, that uh, someone say, William uh, Gurner, to say that hope is also the handkerchief that uh, God puts in the hands of his people to wipe the tears from their eyes. So hope also gives you a perspective. In other words, when you have a hope, a biblical hope, it should change the way you view your life. It should change your perspective, this time to say. It should reframe your thinking so that even though you lose someone, you know that you will see the person again. Even though you may have lost a job, you may have missed a promotion, it's not the end of the world because you know that this life is only a passing through because you have the hope of eternal life and you have to start thinking that this is not the end of the world just because you will bypass a promotion. This is not the end of the world because you miss a business opportunity or you have a, a setback in your business. Because of the hope of eternal life, you should train your thinking you're thinking the hope of salvation. Secondly, hope also brings us a joy. Hope brings us a joy. In Romans 5, 2, through him we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Another verse, Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation and be constant in prayer. So there is something about when you are standing on the promises of God, when you have hope, that hope actually brings joy to you. 
So if you are a person of disposition that is very negative, tends to the depressed and so on, I'm not saying about medical condition, all right, that needs healing, uh, but if you are negative, you always look at the half cup is uh, empty rather than half full type of person, a very gloomy and, you know, you, you, you hardly smile and so on. When you have this hope that, uh, that God is with you, right, through Him, you got the access, if you read verse, uh, Romans 5 verse 2, you have obtained access by faith into His grace in which we stand, you should have joy because you know that you receive the grace of God. That you're in a position, this is a promise, right? That through Jesus, you already obtain, you have access to the, to the, by faith into this grace. That's a promise. And so this hope that you receive, you're going to receive it, you constantly receive His grace, means that you should be rejoicing. And that joy out of that hope should change our outlook, should change our disposition. So Christians should never really look always down, gloomy, negative. You should let that hope in you to say, I, yeah, I receive grace from God day by day through Jesus. I receive that sort of blessing. And so you should not be gloomy, right? You should really be joyful. And after all, Jesus says that if you keep my commandments, so again, a condition, you will abide in me, in my love. You abide in my love. And say, these things that I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. So there's already a promise of God that we always will be joyful. So when we have Jesus, and we hope, our hope, because of our assurance that we are with Jesus, and Jesus has given us joy, so we should therefore build on this hope with that joy to change our pattern of how we view things in life. So the next time when you feel like gloomy, you're down, tell yourself the joy of the Lord is my strength, right? Because you have this hope that God is always with you. Secondly, hope also helps us in our purity. Do you know that? Now, you may think that hope is wishy-washy, right? It's, but actually hope, if you think about hope, it actually helps us in our purifying of our mind. And everyone who does hopes in Him purifies himself as he is pure. Also, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If you hope to be with Him, if you desire to be with Him, then we purify ourselves because Jesus Himself is pure. So when we have this belief that I'm with Jesus and Jesus Himself is pure, I need to be pure as well. When you hope that, yes, I'm in Him, then I also need to be pure in my thinking. So whenever we feel that our mind is Impure when we are full of maybe I'm not just talking about you know bad thoughts about when you say dirty mind or some people say it's more than just about sexual images and things like that it can be thinking bad about other people uh, being jealous these are also impure thoughts bitterness anger unrighteous anger all types and so when we have this hope that the Christ is with us he is in us then we also should purify ourselves, even as he's pure. So think along those lines that I'm with Jesus. I need to make sure that my thoughts are pure. And fourthly, hope also gives us security. Third, look at Hebrews 6, verse 18. So that by two unchangeable things, actually referring to the word of God and the oath, the, prom of the vows of God earlier in the context, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anger of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. Do you know that when you belong to Christ, God is one who does not lie. So no matter what storms of life that we face, ups and downs and so on, the Bible here promises us that we have an anchor. We have an anchor that will make sure, just like a ship, if you're anchored, you've got an anchor at the bottom of the sea. No matter what the storms uh, will affect the ship, the ship will still remain moored, be safe. So no matter what our lives may be, in the, you may be facing fears, anxieties, unknown, troubles and so on, 
Remember, there's a promise here that God says, I gave you an anchor. And so with this anchor, there's this, if you read the verse, there is a hope. All right, there's a steadfast anchor of the soul. It is a hope. Because you are promised an anchor, so you use that hope to know, to tell yourself, to start thinking that I should not allow fear to dominate over me because I have a steadfast anchor. And know that this anchor, unlike the anchor of ships that is like at the bottom of the sea, this anchor is hung actually going the other way. It's anchored heavenwards. It's anchored in, through the Holy of Holies. In fact, it's more towards God himself. Jesus is the one who's the anchor. He's holding you from heaven. That is the anchor of your soul. You will not go adrift if you were to realize, even though you may have fears, even though you may be going through problems and, and challenges, you're going to realize that there is this hope. This hope should then reorientate again your mind to think. Do not let fear to dominate you. Do not let hopelessness, do not let problems, like you may say, I, I, it's an impossible situation to face, but you will say, yes, Lord, I was promised this anchor of my soul, and my hope is in that anchor, my hope is in you. And because I have this hope, I need to think. So we need to retrain our thinking. So, that, so brothers and sisters, faith, yes, is our belief in God. Out of this faith, there is a biblical hope. So please make sure that we start using our brains. Start not just believing, but to say, how can I retrain my thinking as a result of the promise of God that I lay hold by faith, as a result of who God is, His character. I can trust in Him. And as a result, I need to shift my thinking pattern. If you are sort of the, the negative type of person, you need to be positive, to think of what God, that God is there with you. If you are one who's fearful, you need to think of the anchor. If you are one who is having impure thoughts, you need to say, Jesus, I want to meditate on you more so that my, my mind can, can be purified. I'm not going to be a slave to all these negative patterns of thinking. I need to renew my mind, but the renewal of your mind is based on the hope that God has given into your heart, and this hope rests on the Word of God, rests on the faith, which is come by you meditating, standing on the Word of God. So to conclude, are we putting on the helmet of hope? It's time to put on the helmet of hope. All right? It's not just like this, yes? It means start to think. Think on the promises of God. How you therefore have to actively change your patterns of thinking, which may be of the world, right? Which may be deceitful, desire. So it's not just action, but attitude, desires, habits even. based on what God is telling you, and so that we will take every thought captive. This is what the Bible is saying. We are to take every thought captive. How do you take every thought captive? What does that mean, to take every thought captive? Uh, in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it is to demolish arguments. The world will say, ah, oh, come on, how can you be happy just focusing on Jesus? Come on, you know? How do you deal with uh, every pretension that materialism is a way to give you lasting happiness. It's not true. It says, demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against what? Against the knowledge of God. So you see, the world is trying to reprogram you constantly, sowing doubts, but you need to constantly soak ourselves in the Word of God to stand on the promises of God, get that faith, sort out our mind. Taking our thoughts captive means to gain control over what you think about yourself and life. Well, we are into the theme of to grow as disciples and disciple makers. It is about following Jesus. And not only do we need to put on the whole armor of God, in particular, a breastplate of faith and love, but also the helmet of hope in terms of our mind. So let's, uh, amen. So let's uh, meditate through and uh, say, Lord, what, what, what can I learn out of this? Uh, how can I start to think based on the promises that God you have spoken and given to me? How can I lead every thought, not just one thought, but every thought captive for Christ Jesus? So let's uh, 
yeah, let's uh, be still for a while and say, Lord, I need to bring my mind even before you today. Lord, we thank you that uh, the greatest uh, commandment is to love you with all our hearts, with our soul, with our mind, and also with our strength. Lord, thank you that you have given us um, many thousands of uh, promises uh, to see us through so that we always, Lord, will live victoriously because we believe uh, in the victorious Christ. And so, Father, thank you that uh, today your word reminded us again of the importance, Father, of uh, putting on the helmet of uh, hope uh, of salvation. And Father, help us to be able, Lord, to think through uh, so that our our minds, Lord, will be that of the mind of Christ. Our patterns of thinking will be aligned, not to the thinking of the world, not to our own thinking, but rather, Lord, to your thinking. In Jesus' name, amen.